<laughs> Everyone, welcome to the AI stream. I'm Ian Shadden. Um, I'm alone today because everybody's at ECGC. Um, so actually, if you're in the Raleigh area, you should go down to the uh, convention center and say hi. Um, actually, it's, actually, I guess that's not actually going on today. It's just set up today. Maybe it starts tomorrow. I don't know. I remember. I'm, and if I look like I'm talking to myself, it's because Shell's over there. And I can actually see her and bounce something off of her. You can't, you can't. Yeah, they can't see you, but that's fine. So we are going to, yeah, there's the head. <laughs> so what we're going to be going over today is we are going to be, for lack of a better term, wrapping up the AI project. We're not, but we are. So I've taken the liberty of kind of fast forwarding a bit. I've done a bunch of stuff in the project and it's actually not like a lot, but it cleaned it up so that it's actually more functional. And uh, we're actually going to be releasing it at the end of the stream onto the forums. Uh, a lot of you guys have been asking about that, and there's a really weird legal thing that we have to uh, deal with, which was like something about people can't have access to Unreal assets unless they've signed the, the end user license agreement, which means posting things on uh, your own Git or things like that. It's kind of like weird gray nebulous area so we just decided like you know we'll just create a forum and we'll put everything in there and i'll have to have you have to log in to get to it and so whatever we're going to do that and so everybody will have access to this and hopefully what will happen is then we can transfer it to git um, i'm working on getting that going so that for future streams what we would like to do is instead of tackling uh sort of uh a single form of AI, we want to build this project to include different types of AI, starting with different game types. It's actually ideas from Lauren Ridge. We're gonna go through a list of like turn-based strategy, first-person shooter, you know, MMO logic, Paragon, you know, like not the actual bots, but just like the minions. They're actually reasonably complicated if you start thinking about them. Um, and we're going to build them all into this project and just make it available for everybody. Um, so that's kind of where we're at. So I'm going to walk you guys through what I did in the project. And we'll see if we can't build on a little more and show you a little fun thing that I did as well uh, that people might get a hoot out of for um, as one of our Japanese uh, TAs. So anyway, let's, uh, let's jump in. So first things first, expanded the map a little bit. Um, just a little bit. It gave us some more interesting things to play with. And if you see these little spheres on our guys, that'll be the thing I'm talking about here at the end. The fun thing that I did for the guys over in Japan. Um, so if we hit play, we're going to see things look pretty normal. Our, our interface is gone. Um, that's because I moved it. You can now select guys, and you're going to have your interface down the corner. Uh, unfortunately, there's this weird thing with mouse over currently not selecting our guys, and so I don't have a way to highlight um, the people that you can select or the things that you can select so uh pretty simple and then i moved our interface to the hud and you'll probably see that their behavior is a little different now um one they change speed if they are not immediately looking for uh, an apple they actually will chill out a bit and they'll walk around and then they'll accelerate as they know they need something uh, they should hopefully start using RBO avoidance uh, to move around each other because they were stacking up on trees really badly and jamming each other. Uh, it's actually kind of funny because of the way that, you know, they choose to go to a tree based off of, oh, I can't find an apple immediately. Well, then let's go wander towards something I know has an apple or should have an apple nearby. And then when they get there, they, uh, uh, they slow back down and they would jam up and like just all in the same location for whatever weird reason how uh, 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 pardon me, pathfinding works. And we, or pardon, I expanded the tree a bit to include some additional states, which we'll be walking through. So essentially uh, our move to can now be broken out of if our apple is no longer valid. So if everybody finds the same apple, they all go out for it. The first guy that gets it is the first guy who gets it. And then we'll actually break out of this loop in here, and we'll go ahead and we'll meander around a bit before jumping back into the main, uh, main loop to find stuff. Uh, okay, so I just spouted off a lot of stuff, so 
let's start with selection. So let's see, that is going to be in our AIS player controller. Load, there we go. Nothing absolutely crazy here. Uh, as you may remember from like our very first stream, uh, as far as th this uh, um, AI stream has gone, we set up actually left and right mouse button events so that we would know things were going on. Because we knew eventually we were going to want to be able to select things and perhaps click on the interface and tell them to do things. Uh, so it was actually really easy to create a left click and a right click action which exist outside of our left click and our right click hold for like, this is our camera event over here. Uh, the, so this is now in 411. There is, there has been a refactoring of how the Git X and Y on the mouse, uh, the delta for movement has uh, works. If you have a cursor up, it no longer shows. This wasn't cool for what I needed because uh, I kind of always want the cursor to show. So I just started doing uh, the same exact thing that it does, except I'm getting the mouse pointer location and then I'm storing it essentially, I believe, on tick in this case, or is it the end here? Yeah, I'm doing that on tick. Um, somewhere around in here. Where's my tick function go? I just saw it. It's a weird little stack. Oh, yeah, there we go. Event tick, at the end of our tick, we're storing our previous uh, mouse X and Y, and then we're getting the delta, multiplying it by a very small value, and then multiplying it back up just so that, there, this is the sensitivity number that's in the, um, that is normally used for the delta. Uh, it, you can find this in your controllers, or pardon, in the uh, input in your project settings. Um, under input, axis config, not access config. It's uh, no, it should be access config. Thought it was access. Now it's no longer there because there was a. Or maybe it's this one here. No, there was a there was a there was a scale for. <sighs> now FOV scaling is for like field of view. There we go. Sensitivity on your mouse X and mouse Y which is your 0.07. So I could have, I have one of these inverted. I decided not to invert it in here. This is just the raw sensitivity for when the mouse is like not the cursor. So <laughs> when it is the cursor, it just uses your default Windows values. When it is, uh, when it's not the cursor, then it, they, uh, this is the multiplier that's used underneath the hood for your deltas. So I just kind of threw that bit in there and then it was too slow for me. So I could punch in another value here or put this into a variable for sensitivity or, or, or um, right click hold sensitivity. And then we're just setting actor and controller rotation based off of these. Um, so with our, I'm bouncing back, with our click events, so we have our left click action and our right click action. So when these are actually clicks, and we do a left click select and a right click deselect. So when you click, we just do a trace. It's a get hit result under cursor by channel, in this case camera. And we ask ourselves, does it have the interface of usable? Everything is usable. At, I mean, app, the apples are usable for the, um, uh, the, uh, the AI guys. The AI guys are usable for us. If you click on an apple, nothing happens because they don't implement the uh, selected and deselected um, interface functions. So really all we're doing is we're saying, hey, is this thing usable? Because it has the interface usable? Yep, okay, well, let's print its name. And then we will ask ourselves, do we already have a thing selected? And, you know, is this thing valid or is it none? If it is valid, well, we're gonna deselect that thing. So another unit. Uh, for example, another one of our AI guys. And then we're going to set our selected thing uh, internally. So we're going to store it. And then we're going to send the message to it like, hey, buddy, you're selected. Which all it does right now on the AIS character is change the color. So he goes from that grayish to green. Um, letting you know there's visible feedback saying like, hey, this guy is selected. 
Yeah, could have created a widget that goes on top of them, an interface element that shows around them, things along those lines. This was actually really, really simple to, to pull off. Um, then we cast to an AIS character. This is needed so that we can set our HUD element. We need to set the owning pawn on it so that it knows who to ask for the stats. So when it's going through and it's updating, it asks, we, our HUD is set up in such a fashion that all of those interface elements that were floating around before were just directly asking, I, not on tick, but it was like a slow tick of like, hey, what are your stats? We weren't using any delegates or anything fancy like that. Um, so we set the owning pawn on our HUD and then we update the HUD, which forces it to go ahead and if it needs to, um, it'll update all the stat bars on the HUD to uh, our target uh, pawn. Then we set the visibility of this, this widget to visible, because otherwise it's just going to set there with a bunch of zeros on it, so it starts hidden. Deselect, much of the same thing. We deselect. Um, we send the deselect message to the guy. The guy changes the color back to gray. We empty out our selected thing so that our is valid up here on selected will be more uh, operational. And then stored pawn target HUD, um, we say, which is us essentially, we say set visibility to hidden and we actually clear the pawn just in case and I'll show you why. So compile, go ahead and save that. Let's go to our UI, go to our stat block. Our stat block changed a little bit. Now it's in the lower corner. So we added an overlay and a size box so I could actually control the size, but basically it's just wrapped together. The overlay is so that it can contain the entire screen and then the size box allows us to fix the size to a 500 by 750 kind of thing. And then of course the vertical box that we used to begin with, which is where all of our stat bars are gonna go. And then we just have this aligned, you know, at the bottom, but full width. And our size box is uh, all the way to the right and to the bottom. We go to our graph. Not much has changed here. Um, we're getting our game state directly for our event construct. We were doing that based off of something that was already stored. Um, we no longer are getting direct access to the pawns. We're getting direct access to the player pawn. So this wasn't, uh, getting it from the AI character wasn't as useful. Um, so we just need the stat name arrays to create our bars. Our bars are actually going to be coming in blank. They're going to say owning pawn of none. If we were to show the bar, it would just show zeros across the bar, uh, just zeros across the board. No stats, no big deal. And then we're storing them. We need to store them because we're going to have to go tell them in a minute once we click something that, hey, you have pawns that you need to know about. So back in our uh, character controller, we had the update HUD, which happens after we update our owning pawn. So we just iterate through all of our bar children and we say, hey, update your owning pawn. So really quick and easy. And then our stat bar is now, looks exactly the same it now simply says, hey, is this valid? And in doing so, we stop it dead in its tracks, if not valid. So all that additional time that we would, would be sending going through here, asking a bunch of stuff that doesn't exist, a bunch of access nuns and essentially other garbage, not going to happen because as soon as we reset this to zero by using the uh, stat block of clear pawn, just saying, hey, go back through all the step bar children and clear it out. We are no longer going to be hammering through any of this. So we don't have to worry about it. A um, little bit of savings. I mean, I mean, we're still jumping in on tech here to do this, which is way too much. But we could, uh, we could go and adjust our tick time if we wanted to. I believe that's in is it class settings. No, it's under, it's under class defaults. We should be able to modify our tick time somewhere in here. Oh, no, maybe, oh, that's only on actors. Never mind. Never mind. Pay no attention to me. Actors, you can set your tick time. Um, for here, what we could do is uh, on construct, set a timer for a custom event. 
So, custom tick time. And we do a timer. And we do set timer by event. And we plug in these little red ones, which are always fun. Plug that in, kill that off. And then we do it like every tenth of a second or something like that, looping. That way we're not hammering it every frame, which can get completely terrible in like every situation. So file save, come over here, hit play. Find one of our guys, and we see that our interface is updating just fine. The guys are still running around eating things just fine. Okay. So that's a fun little trick right there, by the way. And actually, since we no longer have 10 or 20 of these guys running around, all with their own individual stat blocks floating over their heads, uh, pretty decent savings all across the board as far as like everything that we're doing, because we're only rendering one of these at any given time, and we're only asking one unit for its stats at any given time. So let's see, what else did we do here? Now well, we added more trees, we expanded our behavior tree. So our behavior tree, one com commented a bunch of stuff. So uh, we actually know what's going on instead of just like, you know, run behavior tree, which is a random move to BT. What does it do? It's like, well, this is just our runaround. And we have our adjust movement rate. So I'm gonna double click this. Our adjust movement rate, it's a new task that we're just getting our pawn movement controller and saying, hey, cast to a character movement component. And when we do this, we're gonna set our walk speed either to like 150 or 450, so walk or run. And how we're doing that is we're asking, hey, we have a move rate key. What is that? It could be a bool, it's a bool, but it can be any bool. Currently, we are using, we go into, um, let's see, where's a, where's one of these? It is B is tired. So the same one we're using for our stamina check, which sounds really weird. I'm tired, run more. Um, we're going to go ahead and use that to define essentially like what looks like panic, right? Like, oh, we're mulling around, but oh no, now I need to eat or I'll die. Um, we're setting B is tired and we're using that and we're saying invert it. So when we go back in here, we're like, so we get our movement rate key, we get it as a, a bool, and then if we invert it, true, we say not whatever is coming in here. If not, we just leave it as false, pass it through, and then set our movement rate, succeed. Oh, this was one of these like always succeeds. I mean, I guess we could do, you know, this would be the, the proper way, just in case, for whatever reason, this thing got slapped onto a, uh, a pawn that doesn't have a movement component, um, or pardon, a character movement component, this would save you from trying to figure out, well, why isn't my guy changing speed? Well, you'd be able to go back and examine your behavior tree and realize this, this entire node is um, no longer being processed. File and save. Remember, save all the time. And we are also doing this set movement speed in our random move around. It is the same key, still inverted. It's just, hey, if I'm tired, no matter what, then go ahead and do this. If I'm not tired, then I want to walk. If I am tired, I want to run. It sounds really backwards when I say it like that, but it's the, I think B is tired is actually the problem with the name. We should call it B is panicking. Um, <laughs> so our guy's just like, no, I'm gonna run around, gonna get stuff. So with our movement speed in there, we expanded out, uh, we didn't do anything to our fine food. We expanded out for a simple parallel to give you guys an example of how these work. And our main task is we're going to move towards our desired object. Thing that we want, we're moving towards. But while we're doing that, we want to know if our object is still, like, real, still there. So every half a second, this is going to run. Um, essentially, we're locking execution. If we go back and we look at that real quick. Um, when this is running, so we're moving towards our food item. We know we want that food item, so we're going for it. If it is at, if this hits, well, let me rephrase. We're going to be moving, 
So these two are going to highlight. And then we're going to say, hey, this thing is going to run now too. It's going to jump into this. And while we're moving towards it, uh, we're going we're gonna to have a delay. So it's going to be like, okay, I'm, I'm starting to move towards this. In half a second, I'm going to realize it's still there or it's still not, or it's not, or it's no longer there. And the desired key we're going to check is, of course, the desired object key. We're going to pass that one in there and we're going to say, hey, is this thing valid? If it is valid, we're just going to keep on keeping on. Um, a little awkward with the not here, but it's how the variables are, it's how the, the bool is set up. And then this will either succeed or this will fail. If it fails or succeeds, it actually doesn't matter. Uh, the, if we go back to our parallel, this succeeding or failing has no influence on the main task. The main task is what ends the simple parallel, okay? But we're setting this, this Blackboard value. So the fail out key we're going to set. I created a new bool for that, which is B fail out. Then I created a new Blackboard based condition that will fail out of this entire sequence if for whatever reason this ends up false. Why? Okay, so thinking back, what we wanted our guy to do was run around, find food. If it couldn't find food immediately, like it's like, oh man, I can't remember where one of those apples was. It's gonna be like, but I remember where a tree was because we're tracking the location of all the trees we've ever seen. So we want him to run to a tree and if he gets there and there's nothing there, we actually have him run around for a little bit. And then he starts cycling back through everything. So he'll be like, do I, do I see an apple? No, okay, I need to find a tree. Okay, there's a tree. Look around the tree, is there an apple? And it just rinses, repeats this over and over and over again until he finds an apple and then goes back to just chilling out, walking normal, everything's okay. So, which actually makes me think that, uh, oh wait, no, no, that's fine, cool. Yeah, so this fails out, this entire thing. If for whatever reason he succeeds, and there is, the apple is still there waiting for him when he gets there, because, I mean, where there's five guys running around eating all the, all the apples. And if the apple's still there when he gets there, then we do the exact same thing we used to do, is that we go ahead and we say, pick up desired food, and then we fall backwards. Um, actually, I think I uh, disconnected this, I, um, doing a, a, the test for the fun thing that we're going to talk about here in a sec. So, we fall back on... Uh, pardon, we fired our animation, we picked up our food. With the selector done, this should return successful, and then we will go back to our normal day, uh, normal, normal everything. Oh man. But I bet I just saw a mistake that I made. I wonder if anybody else saw it. So, let's say we're down here. And for whatever reason, and this can happen, This task is running, okay? So you hit it, you're moving to your object, this has been fired, but you're right there, you're right on top of it. So this fires, this fires, this fires, this whole thing succeeds in a quarter of a second. But this has already been fired. So it's gonna sit there, it's gonna wait, and then it's gonna fire off. This task is going to complete. Um, and it's going to be like, oh, okay, well then, I guess we're going to go ahead and fire off. And then suddenly, B fail out is set to, uh, set to true and is never reset. So we need to make sure that we reset that. So I'm just going to go ahead and make sure that's done by moving this task. And we're just going to put in a sequence just in case we actually make it out of there alive and that ends up firing parallel to something else. We're just gonna make sure that that, uh, that resets. This is another simple task I made for this. I make this one all the time. Just set a bool, and it sets it to the value you want. Um, this can be set an object and we can force set to something. But in this case, I found it really useful when you're using a lot of bools and you just need a reset. I just create a simple task that go ahead and give it a bool, give it a value, and have it complete successfully. You can add in, if you want to be really, really fancy, like you want to use this in a uh, uh, a uh, selector, you can go ahead and use a hack result. This is a little trick that I use. You expose that, 
compile. I'm going to set that to true for default. Compile, save. So now that when we come out here, if this was a sequence or if this was a selector for whatever reason, and we wanted it to continue past this node, it's very hacky. Don't advise everybody using this all the time because it gets kind of confusing. Like, why is this failing and succeeding all at the same time? Um, but if you absolutely need to have it just in a, a selector string of you know events going on, it can be kind of useful to have a hack fail out and you're just like, okay, cool, whatever. Um, so, kind of handy there. Um, okay, and then at the end of it all, see if we, now we need to remember a tree, move to a tree. Um, if there, for whatever reason, this uh, fails, like we can't move to, it's like, well, uh, I don't know, so I'm just gonna go ahead and run around again until I find a tree. Essentially, everything is going to fail until such point as he runs around and actually sees a tree. And then I increase the weight at the at the end of the tree. Uh, at the end of everything that's going on, he mulls around for one to three seconds, just standing there, just to kind of break up everything. Otherwise, they're all acting at the same time. It ends up being really awkward. I mean, that's something you can do with a um, kind of like a sequence at the start here. You could be like, oh, wait, you know, a tenth of a second or a tenth to a quarter of a second, and then go off and do your thing, and it makes it so everybody breaks up and isn't acting at the same time. Um, have it based off an initiation thing, and then you just no longer initiate through there. Anyway, so really that's about it. Um, all the miscellaneous fixes that we have done over time, um, all of the behavior is there, the stat block is there, the, the way we crazily implemented it using a, a data table. You guys want to see how data tables work and their structs, it's all in here. And we'll go ahead and make it available. Um, like I said, this is going to be one of the quicker ones. So right before um, we go to Q&A, which I do actually see some questions are popping up here, um, we are going to go ahead and I'm going to show you the fun little thing that I'm also including with this. There came a question. Here, let's close that and bring it back up again. Came a question from one of our uh, technical artists, our DevRel technical artists in Japan. Um, somebody was trying to do freeze. Essentially, how do I make my guys freeze? Like freeze tag style. Um, but have them fall over and shatter. I guess fall over. The hard part is, of course, getting them to topple over uh, without using C++. Which is always the, the problem, right? Like, why don't you want to use C++? Just use C++. Well, fine. Well, physics as, uh, the physics assets, the, pardon, the, the fat, the physics asset tool that works on physics assets, um, has some really awesome stuff in there. But freezing is not something it handles very well outside of code. And then also keeping things going. So what I did uh, was basically create a bunch of um, collision objects that are then parented to a core for collision object, then recalculated as one object. So whenever he freezes, he topples over and he stops his animation and he looks kind of awesome. Um, I'll show you, easier to show. So they're gonna meander and after five seconds, yeah, I'll just kind of topple over, frozen in position. So, if we were to attempt to do this just straight using the fat, what ends up happening is they lock in place. Um, so let's say they were falling from way above. You freeze the fat, and it's like, nope, I'm no longer moving. Freeze our animation, and like, nope, I'm literally no longer moving. So this handles uh, the situation pretty effectively. Now, the real problem is, is I... I Kind of left it to them to figure out the getting up part, which in which case you need two animations, really. Uh, well, four kind of, like rolling over onto your back or your front, and then standing up from your front or your back. Um, and then reinitializing, reinitializing a bunch of stuff. So this is included in the project as well. You guys are super interested in why this works. Um, so I get the velocity of our guy. So we're, we're going to go and freeze. So after five seconds, that's what this timer is. Red line down here goes, unconstruct. 
uh, or on begin play, we say after five seconds, we're going to go ahead and fire this event. So we set our, we get our stored velocity. Um, we set our collision response uh, channel on our uh, capsule component to physics body. Um, our partner channel physics body, we're going to now ignore. What ended up happening is there would be interference and things would get offset really badly. So we just make sure that our, um, physic, our, our capsule component just can't collide with what we're about to do. We set collision enabled on all of our freeze objects. We, our character movement, we set our maximum move speed to zero. This freezes the capsule in place. He will no longer be able to move around. Uh, so the AI, the, if you see the collision capsule, will no longer be able to move. We get our anim instance. We cast it to our third person animation blueprint. And we have a bool in there for frozen. All this does is prevent some animations from working. Um, we'll jump in there here in a sec. Um, and then we detach from our parent our core freeze. And then we attach, pardon, we detach from our parent our core freeze. And then when we attach it to our capsule component, because the core freeze is actually attached to the mesh right now. In fact, it's attached to his chest. Um, no, it's attached to his pelvis, spine, uh, spine zero one. And then we attach to everything else. So all of his, all of his elbow freezes and knees and hands and feet, we attach that to core freeze along with the skeletal mesh. So everything's been locked into position. It's, everything's been moving together and we just suddenly say, nope, you're no longer moving. Now detach everything and reattach everything to the core freeze, including the mesh, which is now frozen in position. And then we set simulate physics. When we are attaching here, we're saying weld simulated bodies. This makes it so all of these guys right here become one big collision object with core freeze. Core freeze is, the, core freeze is the, the parent of all these children. So it creates a giant collision shape for those so that he can bounce around through stuff. Set to simulate physics, linear velocity. We make sure that we add in our velocity to our guy because we want to make sure that he continues forward. Because otherwise what happens is he, he, he runs, 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 stops, and he just freezes. He just stands there. He doesn't do anything. And then I add a little bit of torque. And when I say a little bit of torque, apparently a whole lot of torque, and it doesn't do anything. Um, but just enough to make sure that they topple over so it's fun. Otherwise, it just, like I said, they stand there. So let's go look at really quick um, our third person animation blueprint. And we go to our boop, 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 event graph. We're just using frozen as a sequence. We're storing our speed as our frozen speed whenever this, uh, whenever this fires. We're going to do it once. We're going to be like, well, what was our speed? And let's store that real quick. And then we're going to prevent basically everything else from happening. And then our anim graph, and because this is so simple, the reason, one of the reasons this works is because it's incredibly simple, is with our frozen speed, we can now say um, we're going to set our play rate to either 1 or 0, which is going to freeze our running animation in place. Let's see. Let's uh, back up his speed. So there he is. He's running. And if we set frozen, you can see he stops. And our frozen speed is now set to his previous speed. Our play rate is zero. So he stops moving for all effective purposes. It looks like he's going fast, uh, but it just allows the frame to lock into place and then keep going. There are other ways to do this. There's, um, I believe there's just like a freeze animation on skeletal meshes, which you can use. Um, but for me, this was kind of a, just a quick way for my brain to wrap myself around it. I wanted to do this. I wanted to make sure he stopped in this, in this pose no additional weirdness, and just go from there. And yeah, he can continue to move after the point. So we could then unfreeze him easily in that position um, and then have him quickly blend to something else, for example. So, like I said, yeah, this is what's there, and this is what I'm going to put up on the forms here shortly. Uh, this map makes it, yeah, that's fine. Uh, talking about materials in this map. Um, 
So I'm going to jump over quickly to <laughs> just a regular everyday guy simulator. I got questions here. Um, oh, I'll do that. Remember, Ian, don't shake windows. What do we got here? Okay, questions. How to make crowd AI, how to optimize multiple AI in a scene, how to hide AI if they're not on the screen, crowd and population. So really what we have here is how do we, how do we manage large groups of AI, how to make crowds? Um, and we have the AI crowd controller as well, um, which is actually another question up here. The AI crowd controller, if I remember correctly, is just like your standard controller. Why is there an ostrich on screen? <laughs> Why is there not an ostrich? Okay, fair enough. Why is there not an ostrich? Um, so if we go to our AI controller. So first of all, crowd controller. Um, we can reparent our blueprint here. This is, this is our AI controller. Crowd. So we have detour crowd AI controller. How this operates is just slightly different. Um, I believe this just works still. I think if we compile play, we end up with slightly different behavior. Um, oh, yeah, maybe I should <clears throat> stop our guys from falling over. Let's just go disconnect that uh, timer so that we can actually see this in action. We may not actually see much given the um, uh, the fact that we're using RBO. Because RBO is going to have them all pass on the left kind of deal. Oh, now we're seeing a little bit of it. So what you're going to see is as they get close to things, they start kind of twisting around them and slowing down. Um, if we tried to force one of these guys to actually get on, get next to something, it's where you really start to see it. They start to they kind of start freaking out and trying to wiggle their way closer and closer and closer to their target. Um, so the detour uh, AI is meant to um, make sure that they don't start clumping together like normal AI does. I mean, if we, don't, if we turn off RBO, these guys just stick to each other. They stack up in a location and they just stick to each other. So the detour is really good for preventing that from happening, but it has the downside of additional calculations and the downside of some things can look unnatural. Um, moving up to cover. Can be really awkward for them once detour is turned on. Um, they start to kind of like, I want to be at the cover, and they kind of just like, but it's so far away, and they kind of pull themselves closer and closer and closer, and then they finally get there, and they're like, okay, now I can duck down, and they duck down. I mean, in most cases, they've already been shot like thousands of times, um, but I mean, it's not meant for that kind of stuff. It's meant for large numbers of AI interacting with, with each other so they can fly around each other. Um, large number of AI, we've talked about this before. I Honestly, let's just put that on, yeah, no, we should just put that on the list of the AI stuff that we're going to cover. I think it would go really good if we start doing the, uh, the Paragon Minion AI. I think that'll be a really one to stack all that into. Um, because from what I can tell, what you want to do is you want to have sort of a, a, a grand controller, a flow controller, a, a master AI that sits above everything and says, all right, everybody, we're going down the lane, or we're going to the train station, or whatever we're doing, we're going this way. And everybody's like, okay. And they start moving towards locations that are given to them based off of the command AI saying, okay, you're located in the back, so let's not move you as far ahead as everybody else, that kind of thing, right? And then everybody's just like, okay, I don't have to really think for myself. I've been told to move. When individual combat or something like that would begin, then maybe I start to operate on my own. But at the end of the day, everybody's just kind of moving forward. I mean, we could look at Dynasty Warriors as an example, where a lot of times you're not being attacked, but you're surrounded by a lot of guys who are mulling around. They're in the background, just moving left and right, and really we get into the cost of a static mesh at that, or pardon, a skeletal mesh at that point, comparatively to the AI, because it's just move to your left, move to your right, and if we run into each other, RBO takes over, and it's actually really effective and efficient. Um, and then, how do we hide AI? 
hiding AI in this case is like, well, you gotta, we, you know, you're talking about preventing them from running. Um, you allow them to continue to move, but instead of maybe ticking through their entire behavior tree, you start slowing it down. Um, I think there's a way to do that. I'd have to talk to Mieszko. Um, it seems like something they would have done for Fortnite. Uh, we have a lot of those guys off in, the, off in the distance, right? They're doing their thing. But I imagine Fortnite is really just more of a, a swarm mentality where it's, they don't actually think much. It's more along the lines of, I'm a dude, I'm going to go kill you. If I can't kill you, then I'm going to go to the place that I've been told to go to, and that's it. Um, and then if I see you close enough using perception, or maybe just using a simple, hey, I'm in range, then I'm going to move up to you, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to punch you in your face. Um, yeah, but that is, a, that is a large question that I think we'll just go ahead and do maybe an entire section on in our upcoming ideas for the AI stream. Because uh, it would work for RTS games, games that have any swarm mentality like Fortnite. It works for the Paragon minions. So I'm going to go ahead and table that one for any further conversation. We get this one all the time. I think I've seen this question almost every stream, if not every other stream. This, this one's been on there. I think even one with Mieszko on here, and we talked about it. Um, so we'll, we'll go ahead and just see if we can knock out an example of it. What do you say? Uh, so that covers that one. Will Mieszko do someday the stream he had to cancel about exploring engine code? Uh, I hope so. Uh, I want to get them back on, and we want to go deeper into everything that is uh, about the Unreal uh, AI source. I mean, this is partially a C++ project. Um, I will be shipping the binaries that will work with 4.11.1, because they're not big. I mean, the entire project zipped up is like 20 megs. But if you want to build it against another version, remember you're going to have to have things like Visual Studio installed. Um, and getting deeper into the engine code down there for the AI would be absolutely fantastic. I mean, the one stream he did with us that he helped us make those uh, uh, those tests for EQS was great. I mean, really, really insightful and really fun to see how easy it is, right? It's not terribly complicated. Um, so yeah, definitely need to, we want to get Mishko on as much as well, as much as possible. Um, so maybe. I hope so. Yes, kind of. Uh, could you talk a little bit more about run behavior node and the behavior trees and what other practical application you'd use them in? I think I'm misunderstanding concepts where you use them. Thanks. Okay, so uh, run behavior tree. I actually have one, right? We're actually using a couple of them. So if you have a modular action, in our case, we have our run around. Um, let me crack that one open too. A random move to, which is, yeah, it's four nodes in a sequence, right? Like, this isn't terribly complicated, and we could easily copy that out, and we could put that right here. It could be in another sequence here. Everything would be fine, except our tree starts getting really beefy and kind of hard to read. So why not put them into a whole other tree that we can operate and then not have to worry about any of that. Um, and we use it again over here where we, oh, we haven't found a tree, so let's just run around. And that means I would have to copy this behavior all the way over here. And so once I've used it twice, once I've used an entire tree twice, it's time to make it modular, right? Like it, the, everything is exactly the same. Um, I mean, we could arguably do that with a chunk of our fine stuff. So we're attempting to find uh, our, um, our apple, and then we're failing at that, so we're going to go ahead and change what our desire is to our tree. Well, what if we just change that down? What if we modularize this entire thing, and instead of looking for an apple in a special way and a tree in a special way, we just made this one thing? And then it would be here at the sequence level. We take all the Blackboard stuff, tack that on top of our new run behavior. Um, and then we would be like, oh, but when that fails, then we'll just do it again. But now we're doing it for the tree. And we just have a different, we just feed all the data into the EQS. Um, it makes sense. There is 
minor overhead for it. And when I say minor, I really mean minor. Um, it used to be bad, but it's not. It's, these are absolutely wonderful and fine to use. Um, use them, abuse them, good times. They, um, they work off of, just make sure they're on the same blackboard. Uh, as you can see that I have full access to my blackboard here. And you won't have much of an issue with them. Definitely use them. Um, guess it's just it's just really about if I have a it's it's a macro. If you're sitting there in your blueprint and you have a macro, if you're sitting in C plus plus and you're like, I need a function for this, I'm gonna be I'm gonna be doing this a million times. Same thing, same exact thing. Organization and making sure things remain uh, legible. We loaded, have we ever loaded up the bullet train uh, AI? Like, those trees are ridiculous because we had to work so rapidly on them. I mean, they're, there's not a lot of run behaviors going on in there, and there really should be a lot of run behaviors going on in there. So definitely, definitely check them out for organizational purposes at least. Um, what is the difference between detour and crap? Are there two different types of detour here for AI controllers? I don't believe there are. Um, pardon, reparent, detour, or crowd? No, there's just the detour crowd AI controller. In this case, um, the detour crowd AI controller, detour and crowd detour. Okay, so. Crowd detour, I think, is just a naming thing where it was just like, this would primarily be used for crowds of AI. And when we say detour around things along that lines, normally we mean like RVO, um, which is a, it's just a method that two AI are moving towards each other and they decide we both are now turning left and they go around each other because they got close enough to each other that they realized, oh, we need to go left around each other. And RBO avoidance works that way. Um, so I'm not sure what is uh, the, the real question here. What is the difference between detour and crowd detour? There's no like detour AI. It's all just crowd detour. Or there may have been, and they've all been merged back into crowd detour. So um, that's really all I know on that. It looks like, great. Thank you, Ian. Um, I think that's all the questions I have, unless something pops up here in chat in the next 20 seconds. I really don't have anything else for you guys. I need to go put up a forum post, and I need to dump this stuff up there for you guys. So, um, I guess that's it. We're uh, Alan Noon. Actually, I, do you know what's coming on in the Thursday stream, Shelley? I, nobody knows what's really going on with the Thursday stream because of ECGC. I, I've heard jokingly from Alexander he was going to periscope the entire thing. Um, from ECGC. I don't know if he's doing that. Probably not. Um, oh, oh, one last question. What is the crowd AI option? What is the crowd AI options in the settings? What settings? Um, are we talking about the AIS controller? Uh, well, last settings. Actor tick, replication input actor. Uh, not seeing any. Let's wait. Hold on. Editor settings. Editor settings. Oh, oh. So like under. Um, okay, we'll open them both up real quick. That way we just have access to them. All right. So wow. Okay. So it separated them. That's not awesome or optimal in the least. Those together, please. So let's see project settings, AI system. Um, do, 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 do. Don't uh, AI hot spot, not so much. The nav system, where most of this would be. <laughs> I'm not speaking much. The what? The the ostrich? Uh, the pirate? There's a. It's a pirate ostrich. That's awesome. 
You just... Oh, jeez. Um, okay. Oh, fine. C-R-O-W-D. Not sure exactly where we're looking. So we will just look for the word crowd in our project settings. No, it was detour, wasn't it? No, it's... Getting the impression that this is going to be in project settings. All at a hunch. Probably not up in these three. Nothing in AI. Console, garbage, but NAS mesh system. Physics friendly. Training? It's not going to be in platforms. I'm not entirely sure where this would be the settings. I, so I guess I'm. I'll get back to you on this one. I'll see what kind of crowd settings that we can actually find. It might be something that we actually do in Blueprint, and I'm just not seeing it right here. Oh. Engine Crowd Manager. And where, where you were in the kitchen. Project settings? Engine? Crowd Manager. Yeah, under Cooker. Under Cooker? No, no un like literally underneath Cooker. Oh, holy... There are some days I'm blind, people. All right. So, oh, I do remember this. You know what I remember about it? I remember that this didn't used to have settings. Like, well, the avoidance config was here, but it was empty. Oh, but man, a lot of this looks like it'd be really useful. So, Basically, what all of this is setting up is one, your max agents to deal with max number of crowd detour AI agents. Uh, your agent radius, your max agent radius is kind of like how big they are. Um, max avoided agents. Um, so you don't want all agents avoiding all other agents, so they choose like the six most important ones to deal with them. Max avoided walls, how many static meshes do we avoid? Nav mesh check interval, how often does it check nav mesh? Path optimization interval, and basically, how often do I re-figure out how to get to where I'm going? Um, and then, do they resolve collisions or not? Uh, basically, if things are forced into each other. So those are your like your simple kind of basic setups. Um, uh, and then for each one of those, you can or pardon for each one of the there are avoidance configs, which I'm not entirely sure how it chooses between them. We'd have to get uh, Mieszko on here to talk about this. Because um, I'm pretty sure, like, or maybe it just does these in order. Because we can see at the bottom that um, we're seeing at least adaptive depth and adaptive rings is being are being increased. So while these things may be equal, each one of these is more intense than the last. So it may be that these are solving issues where it's just like, oh, I couldn't figure this out. Go to the next one. Okay, that one didn't work. Go to the next one. Okay, cool. This one allowed me not to collide with everybody. I will go ahead and take my solution and run with it. And the next guy runs and figures out, oh, zero, one, two, three, down the line. Um, really, this is one for Mieszko to talk about. Like I said, I never really got this to work too much. Um, the velocity bias, desired velocity weight, and current velocity weight are things that I messed with in an attempt to get my guys to like take cover more rapidly while using the, the crowd manager. Um, but I could never find numbers that made them not look like they were either A, freaking out, or B, really unsure about what they were about to do. Um, but as far as just crowds go, it actually worked really well. Um, you could have a ton of dudes on screen just using the default settings and they would work around each other really well. Just use the Crowd Detour AI controller, and this stuff just kind of magically works. Um, but we'll get you know, Mieszko on, or I'll grab him, and we'll write some documentation on it. We'll post it up for everybody. Um, can you attach AI perception to a bone, like the head? Uh, yes. Um, indirectly? There, you can. Because it is based, the perception component is a part of the AI controller. 
And the anti controller can be attached to your. Um, let's see, if we go down here to controller transformer, we'll just say attached to pawn. Uh, if we do that, it's kind of interesting in that you'll see. Uh, let's pause real quick. We go and we look at our dudes. Sorry. Our dudes. They now have their AI controllers attached to them, which is great. Um, but that's just one level of attachment because the AI controllers are an actor. You can force attach the AI controller to their heads. Um, so we could do uh, just um, let's go. Let's just do it. Let's do this. Let's do this. This is actually something I can show, and it's really easy. Um, let's see. We are running behavior tree. Are we getting our pawn? We're not getting our pawn. Does that really matter? No, because we're getting our AI controller here, aren't we? Da, 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 da. No, not in tick. Or zombie game. Mesh, dynamic material, stuff, stored game state, get data tables. Seriously, I'm not storing the data. That would be terrible. I am, yeah, neither of these things are doing. Okay, cool. Whatever. We're gonna do that then. We're gonna do a sequence. S E Q U E N S E. Learn to spell E M. And just in case, we'll do a quick delay of uh, basically points. Actually, I'm just gonna do zero. Just do a frame delay. And we're going to let's see. Get AI or get controller cast to AIS con. If that is successful, we are going to attach to your component, or do we have to do it? I think we do actor. And then we do repair actor of. No, wait, I don't want to do that. Oh, no, it has the uh, bone name. Let's go figure out what our bone name is. This may result in some really weird stuff. Uh, back over. Kill down. Spine, spine, spine. A bunch of clavicles. Neck, head. We're just looking for the word head. By the way, if you didn't know this, you can actually copy your select bone names. So if you have really complicated bone names and you don't want to remember what to type, remember that right click. Keep minimizing. Well, we can't tell that I work on multiple monitors. Uh, no, no. Yeah, no, who's here? No. Wait a minute. Oh, hell's in the way. Can I close that real quick? Open that back up. I have apparently broken all the things somehow. Weird. Let's go ahead and save real quick. Save Ian. Paste. Why you added the extra line, but hey, whatever. Head, and then we'll just do snap to target, uh, keep world scale. And I think this works. If not, we attach it to a component, and we just, I mean, let's just set that up real quick while I'm here. Attach to component. Head, in parent, mesh, pocket head. Uh, actually, yeah, let's just do that. Looks way better. That looks like it'll work. <laughs> okay, file, save. Now it should play, pause. We uh, collapse some of this up. Should say that the AIS controllers, because I'm pretty sure I turned that off of attached to parent. 
Uh, let's go ahead and play again. If we hit the... Yep. You can see a little bit. This guy is now operating off of his head joint. The head joint is kind of... Where is he? Hold on. Yeah, it looks like he's operating off of his head joint. It's really hard to tell. Yeah, that's at head level now. It's no longer at waist level. And it looks like the head, uh, it's just attaching to it. I don't think it's uh, inheriting its rotation just yet. I think we're manually setting the control rotation to be flat. Probably why we're seeing a little bit of freak out. So, there you go. Uh, yeah, the freak out's more like it completely caused by something I've done in the past. So yes, you can totally do that. Yes, it totally works. And if you have cone vision, uh, so that instead of just being like a flat plane, that is a triangle that goes out, you have a full cone that will allow you to look up and look down and then not perceive anything outside of the cone. Um, question, would it be possible to link this AI to a chat box? I actually have no idea what this question means. Um, our AI don't say much. In fact, they say absolutely nothing. In fact, they literally say nothing now because I broke the functionality that had them actually say things when they found stuff. So, <laughs> I'm super confused. There used to be a Detour AI controller and a D2 Crowd AI controller. They're no longer showing up. Uh, he probably unified them. Honestly, I don't know the direct answer to why one exists, why it doesn't one exist. Um, but they, um, the other one no longer exists. So, sorry. We can talk to we can talk to Mieszko and see what happened. They probably do the same thing now. It may have just also been. Um, something that they use like in Fortnite comparatively and then they made they ported it all over into main and then they said okay let's rename it and they created two different branches of it and then suddenly it's like why are we doing this and they merged it back down stuff happens so, alright that's what I got I'm not seeing any more questions pop up so again don't know what's going on on Thursday everybody's at ECGC Next week, Alan Noon will be on. We'll be talking more about 2D stuff. Um, you guys keep on asking for him. No joke. Um, and keep asking for him. Like, he, he doesn't believe that what he's doing is that awesome. And I would have to disagree. So, uh, anyway, you guys have a good time. We're out.